Hey, Robert. Sir. Are we about to see a pivotal moment in recent real estate history unfold? Pivotal? No. More of the same? Yes. Well, we've had a pretty monumental change, material change this week. And on this episode of Real Estate Chat with... Jonder Perez. And Robert Ede, we're going to go into what the actual numbers that were confirmed by the Toronto Regional Real Estate Board Market Watch was, how that compared to Robert's, which is very, very close, except for one thing that wasn't discussed by everybody else that we're going to be talking about today. Robert, why don't we start with that discussion? Sure, okay. Uh, this chart, even though the numbers are very small, breaks down the number of what is termed relists. Uh, starting May of last year, 22, I forget. Uh, the Toronto Real Estate Board has been preparing this realist share comparison chart, except not promoting it. It's the same format as they used for the LDM listing days on the market, property days on the market, where they've done a little more in-depth analysis into days on the market. And it's you know done by each individual reporting area. Uh, but they put it, they don't promote it. They don't put it on the front of the thing and they don't talk about it in any way. I'm the only one that seems to be making a big deal about the consideration that these realists. Now, what is a realist? A realist is a property that comes on the market and then within the same original listing period that they, they listed it for, the same property with the same owner and the same listing broker comes through the system again. And the system counts it again, which affects the new listings. You can do this three times within a month. And so you've got four a four count for one property. How many times can you sell it? Once. How many times can should it be counted? Once. Do the duo do ors affect it? If there gets to be a substantial number of them. Now, this chart shows that last month they say, oh, there was 18,000 and some uh, new listings. But when we look at it, we say there was 4,400 and nearly 4,500 read this according to their definition like some slipped through on some technicality so which represents 24 percent of that huge big number now if you get the discounted number of 14,000 124 or something or other subtracting the relist from the from the grossed up new and get net new listings which we've got a chart later on showing it it shows that 33 point something or other percent of all the listings under consideration for buying you can only buy them once are doubles so we've got too many listings being thrown into the counting of what's the sales to new listing ratio and what's, we'll look at this today. This is the thing that nobody has, seems to talk about when I brought it up at the annual meeting. Uh, Jason, very nice fellow, Mercer, following instructions, says we're not going to include that metric on the front because we did a study and every time since 2003, when these pick up, they fall down. So it's a temporary... Uh, phenomenon. I asked him at the time, do you mean it's transitory? And everyone laughed, but they didn't do anything about it. Hmm. So on we go. This is that oh. this is the treb chart that gets published on hidden, but it's there by them. Under the under the card, they 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 slip it under the rug. But here's my question for you, Robert, yep. is yep. you know, and it might be significant, might not be just for the real estate stat geeks who yep. like subscribe real to real estate chat. Yeah. Uh, the realist shares do vary by region. And what's really neat about this is you'll have certain regions where it's so rampant. Like, for example, Durham region compared to everything else, 25% versus, let's say, for example, City of Toronto, 23 So not much of a difference there. Uh, but within Durham region, you have, for example, Pickering, where 32% almost um, are terminate relists. Uh, and so what does that say about particular regions, if it does say anything? And if well, you the, smaller, the, the smaller the, the sample the wider the variation in what it is. Um, like if we just use this number, it, I think the minimum is uh, 16 and the maximum is 31, which is a lot. But if you look at it exactly, you'll see that, you know, there was only 25 listings. And so it, it, it's skewed by the small and small sample. But uh, everybody is doing it just about the same. As I say, if you use this 24%, that is an average of all of the uh, listings and all of the relist uh, done as a function. So uh, some will be higher, some will be lower, but everybody's doing it. All right, everybody's doing it. Now let's look at the new okay. list. So this is the same numbers, except we got two lines representing both of the things. So the blue line here is what's reported 18612, 
as the new listings, which is compared to 10 year, it's uh, three years more than the 10 year. You compare it to the five year, it's 14, 15% over the five year. Um, but when you subtract the 4487 due hours and get 14,125 net, we find out that we're actually 21.8 percent below the 10-year average. So why are prices being steady, in this case going up? Because there's not very many for sale compared to normal, the 10-year being normal. So this is a very important statistic that is being not taken into consideration because it's not presented by the board, it's not uploaded to create, it's not incorporated into the results that all these uh, pundits and great seers uh, are allowed to consider when they're making the prognostications about things that they don't know anything about. Okay, so here's the uh, the sales to new listing ratio, and then which is the uh, red line, and this that's the standard method of calculating, which comes out to if you have um, the seven thousand sales that we enjoyed divided into the um, new listings of eighteen thousand. Uh, a 37% take up. So which suggests it's a buyer's market. And that would mean there's a lot of properties that are not selling. Now, when you subtract out and you find that we're in a, a, a 7,000 into 14,000, then it's 49%. It's a very, very, very balanced market. It's right smack in the middle. So it's the same thing turned sideways. They use sales to new listing ratio. I don't use that. I use months of inventory because you can't cheat on that. You got a certain number of sales. You got a certain amount of standing inventory on the last day of the month. You done one into the other. And that's your consistent uh, barometer. Here we go showing that there's like it's a 31% difference between um, 49 and 37. So it's a big difference. Huge. I mean, that would that that's enough to change the sentiment of uh, of how well, it's, it's it's misrepresentation, or let's say it's disrepresentation because they're purposely not mentioning something that has a has a a, a vital importance. Okay, so here's our active inventory, which is the same um, as we've been watching all the way along twenty one seven sixty. Now there was a huge number of expiries, so at the end of the day of this, there was a great number that expired and they went away. So someone making a, a from the mortgage business, making a, a comment this week saying the huge number of relists on, uh, or new listings coming on the market on Wednesday was a lack of understanding. Well, the guy's not a practitioner. How can he be expected to, to understand what he's looking at? A huge number of listings expired or were terminated at the end of the month and they tried it again. And a lot of them exterminate were terminated and tried it again because they were buoyed up by the fact, well, maybe we've got a new time coming. Let's change the price a little. Let's change the terms a little bit. Let's put it through the system again with some new photographs and restage it. And we'll have a recharge now that everything's going to change with the Bank of Canada sentiment finally telling us that we're the worst is over. So we compare this to what? We compare it to the five-year, which was boom all the time. We're 50% over that, 53%. To the 10-year, we're a third over that. And to the 16%, to the 16 year, we're 16% over that. So there's lots of inventory, except the other factor that's nobody talking about, that if at least half of the new listings coming on the market, right, for the first time, somebody puts the property on the market, they do this low list low and hold. So they list it less than their expectation. And they said, we don't want any offers for five or seven or 10 or 15 days. And so you can't buy that house that day, unless you want to wait overbid the asking price by like 17, 29%, you can't buy it that day. So again, they're not active listings. They are not available for purchase. So there's inventory. All right, now let's look at what uh, prices are. Prices, doing. This, is, this is where the rubber hits the road. Again, we have the third highest May ever. And this shows the two higher ones. Uh, 2023 and 2022 were the only times when the price was higher and not by a great deal. We are, uh, the peak May shows there were um, uh, 4%, 388 uh, less than the peak. So you can't say it's bad. Last year was, uh, we're down uh, 254. So you can't say it's, it's bad. It's from, those are the best months of May ever. And uh, we're seeing how we've broken down one from following almost uh, in lockstep 
the uh, results from last year, 2023, we're now lower than that. Uh, but we're still, as we say, the uh, the third best May ever in uh, what's supposed to be a bad time. So nothing wrong with it. School so year. In this case, this is where we look at it from another point of view. This chart starts in September and goes to August. It's a school year, I call it. And it very much shows the blue line with the red stars tracing, tracing, tracing exactly the same path as the year before. And then two years ago is this big mountain red that we're not following. So when we came through January, December, we said, well, there's a huge path in between one year ago and two years ago. Where are we going to fall? And we didn't know. And we see that it's almost exactly the same as 2023. Same false rally. Now we'll see what happens. Um, if we look at the continuing on in 2023, it falls off a little bit. Starting two months later, it falls off a little bit. Uh, we'll see. We'll well, see. So what you, listings uh, appear. So okay, here's so the question. Is it going to be pivotal? We don't know. We yeah. don't know how many listings are going to come up. And it's the number of listings that's going to determine the price. And that's what's going to determine the sales. So we're going to hold on to that thought in the end when I ask you a very pivotal question then. So let's look okay. first at uh, here, your, your chart. Okay, well, this is looking into the future where we're guessing which market are we emulating? And right now we've changed. We're not following the same pattern as all as the 1990s market. We are still behind. After uh, two years, we have not broken the 90 percentage. 90 percentage of the uh, the highest peak, everything, all the last five markets are lined up at 100% on this, and then we're stretching out. Um, three of the four previous had broken it by the 24-month period. We haven't, but we're close. We're at 87%. So uh, we'll continue to watch. Are we at the beginning of a good time, the beginning of a bad time? We can't say. I hope it's not bad. Okay, this is uh, Mitch Corman's uh, in, uh, feeling that we should look at the top end. Where's the $5 million house? Well, we only have $2 million houses, and the share is increasing. 7% um, uh, share, uh, which is much greater than it was, not quite as much as it was in the crazy times of uh, September 21 to June 22, but uh, certainly uh, far beyond uh, what the four-year average and what the six-year average um for this statistic is so uh, there's many more houses that are worth more than two million dollars as well okay so here we are on um the same school year september to august and this is sales and our blue line with the blue stars the narrow to it we're in 23rd place of 29 as far as sales are concerned so we've been doing that all the way along last year in may it was the 14th best um may and now we're at the 23rd so the the number of sales is way off 30 percent off and the number of uh price or the price are off by three percent so what is keeping the prices up inventory supply demand and consumer confidence so that's the same chart again just showing you from the regular december i'm sorry january through december we've got an arc that goes shows the typical uh spring uh, buoyancy and now where are we going to go which one are we going to follow uh, we're not setting any records question time robert so sure. announcement of the rate cut yeah uh, we've got a lot of comments on that particular episode and it did happen so that is sort of what i was suggesting as pivotal but we, you and i talked about it in previous episode that this is more of a confidence last perception issue rather than an actual affordability issue because a quarter point yes you'll feel it in the pocket but it's not really much if you really think about it so are we going to see a busy summer as a result of this or are things going to go as a normal summer would but what should a real estate chat viewer who's now making a move they've missed that point of maybe they had a chance to negotiate pre rates going down but now if, if the market is on an upward trajectory at this point did they miss out or is there still a window of opportunity to make a strategic move? Okay, did we miss out? Now, there's a very good question. No, you didn't. The quarter point dropping means that we're going to see one for sure, two, maybe, three, maybe, and within a year from now, next June, uh, a point less for sure. And if you've got a variable rate, that adds up to a significant component. What it also means is the price of borrowing money for any significant purchase is coming down. And 
instead of worrying that it's going to be more, now you can be assured that it's going to come down. That's why if you go and negotiate a mortgage with the Royal Bank or Joe Blow Trust or whatever it is, they know that rates are also coming down. So they will give you less than their posted rate because they know if you're taking a five-year lock, that for uh, three quarters of that time, the rates will be lower than they are now. So they might as well get you your good credit, good property, good income, solid. Then they might as well get you tied up for the sake of half a point, but they'll give you a half a point now, sometimes more than that. So um, the purchase price is the most important thing. However, the individual property, where is it located? What school is it in? What condition is it in? What neighborhood is it? Is this the type of people that you want to live with? Is this the people that you want to be far away from? Is this the type of nuisance factors you want to be far away from? Acquiring the the the, the ideal property, if you're going to live there for five or seven years, 10% doesn't make any darn difference. It's a matter of acquiring it. If you don't get it, you'll be looking over your shoulder saying, oh, shit, I should, really should have got that. Oh, I really like them. And if you really like it, just pay. Don't worry about it. And don't let the interest uh, at five and a half or six percent stand in your way all right prices do we have a price floor now and is it fair to say that whatever happens this summer if if anything the prices are at the lowest levels now that they're going to be because again as we suggested in previous episodes there's an inverse relationship between the cost of borrowing money and what the price is of what you're borrowing are prices now as low as they'll be for the next foreseeable future and should somebody be worried about it dropping lower or should buyers be worried about it that they're going to start to inch upwards? Okay, complicated question, but very simply answered. The mix of properties in the course of the summer is different than the mix mix of properties on April the 15th that contribute to the average price. So the average price we, we, we monitor, but it's, it's, it's an average of an average and an average and an average. I don't think we've reached a floor. But the floor will be in like condos that are owned by non-occupants. Uh, that's still going to going to fall down. There's still people that are hurting and are going to sell. And the magic answer to your question and the guess the, the 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 thing that needs to be considered about pivotal and nobody knows is how many new, fresh, beautiful owner occupied listings are going to appear uh, over the course of the summer. And we normally say fewer than in the spring. Uh, it should be that way, um, but it might not be. But I, I think it stopped people from being scared into selling a property where they're on the knife edge. And there's I think we hope, have there's hope for next year. Yeah, and we'll have a bit more realistic expectation. But as you astutely pointed out, that there are different markets when it comes to condos versus freeholds, and also the different neighborhoods that there are in. So we've got to watch inventory. We've got to watch, as Robert said, who owns the property and why are they selling. Uh, because this could still drag on. I mean, a quarter point drop is sure great. For it's an indication, as you said at the beginning, but it, it doesn't change anything apart from mentally. Exactly. There you go. Well, why don't you share with us your thoughts in the comments? If you have any questions about where the market is headed, or if you've got your own insight, feel free to share it with us in the chat and make sure you watch our rest of our episodes because we're going to have some summer fun chatting about real estate and seeing where this real estate market goes. Thanks for watching this episode of Real Estate Chat. Take care and bye for now. Bye for now.